Coming up on this episode of DL Weekly, Magic Happens finally returns along with the dining package. The foodie guide is out for the Food and Wine Festival. Princess Night details a controversial musical coming to DCA. We finish our conversation with Alex from the backside of water and more. DL Weekly starts now. Hello, everyone. Welcome aboard the DL Weekly podcast. Please lower your head and watch your step while boarding. If this is your first time listening, we hope you'll check out our website at dlweekly.net. If you have more time to spend, becoming an official weekly tier at dlweekly.net slash support is an especially good value. Thanks for traveling with us today, and we hope you have a happy and memorable listen to this week's episode. Hello and welcome to this episode of DL Weekly for the week of March 1st, 2023. I'm Teg Bushman. And I'm Teresa Urban. Thank you to Jamie K for becoming an official weekly tier on our Patreon. Our supporters get some pretty fun perks like DL Weekly swag, bonus content, and access to our Discord community. A special thank you to Aaron D, Steve H, Megan O, and Sarah M for your continued support. If you would like some more Disney magic in your day, head on over to dlweekly.net slash support to join the community. Well, you've heard us talk about our great experiences staying at the Howard Johnson Anaheim. Well, we have partnered with them to offer our listeners some cool discounts. Weekly tiers can get 15% off their stay, and Magic Keyholder weekly tiers get 20% off. To take advantage of these discounts, head on over to dlweekly.net and click on the Howard Johnson logo. Be sure to use the promo codes listed on the website to get the discount that you qualify for. Now let's get to the news. Well, Friday was to be the glorious return of Magic Happens. Unfortunately, Mother Nature had other plans, and Magic did not happen until Sunday when the weather allowed for it. The only thing missing was the Princess and the Frog float, which was experiencing technical difficulties, but should return soon. The Orange County Register reported that over 50% of the original cast of the parade returned. I am so happy that this parade is back And I do feel very sad because this poor parade, right? It was only going for a couple of weeks before the parks closed down. And then its big grand debut gets rained out, not once, but twice. At least it was able to step off for both performances on Sunday, the 3.30 and I believe it's 6.30 are the two shows. Yes, 3.30 and 6.30. But yeah, super fun. I personally very excited to see this when we're there during our next trip. However, I want to see this so bad in like the evening dusk time hours. So it's always 3.30 and 6.30. However, this time of year, magic happens as a little bit extra special because the 6.30 parade becomes a nighttime parade because it's just dark out already. So or it's like dusk and darker out. And a lot of these floats have light like there's um lit up porch they just look i don't know it just looks extra magical to me at night i don't know what it is it's not designed to be a nighttime parade but it pulls it off very very well i mean i'm a fan because if anybody could see me right now recording this episode i have a hey hey shirt on and there is a hey hey there little a hey, hey. basket thing so i'm very excited to see that yeah it's kind of funny because the oh my goodness they put so many of these pictures in here it's wonderful yeah i just felt so bad for this parade not getting a good shake in the beginning. I know. And we brought back the electrical parade for like the hundredth time, but we didn't bring this one back. But now this one is here and back. I just think it looks so colorful and pretty. Mm-hmm. And we've got a lot of like newer things that haven't really the been represented. The floats are ton. beautiful. You know, because we've got like Coco and all of that stuff Moana. in it. Moana. Moana. So very, very excited to um, see this in person and the Princess and the Frog float to come back because uh, it was having some technical difficulties. So... Mm-hmm. I'm really excited to see this in person and listen to the music and everything. Mm -hmm. I do think it's also really, really cool that over 50% of the original cast of the parade did come back for the kind of return. Yeah, for for the for the return of this parade, because it's been a while. You know, those people, I'm sure like they had to have had other things going on in their life between early 2020 and now so that's really really incredible and kind of i think kind of speaks volumes to this parade they must have you know you have to have felt really attached to this parade and really excited for it to come back three years later to be a part of it again i just think that is so so cool yeah costumes look really neat it's very colorful as with Mm -hmm. all disney parades they've got tons of energy the music is fun yeah 
good things, all good things. Well, along with the return of the parade, there's also the dining package at the Plaza Inn. For $45, an adult meal includes short rib and fried chicken with pesto, mashed potatoes, seasonal vegetables, dessert, and a fountain beverage or water. Guests also get a voucher for a reserve viewing section for the second Magic Happens performance. So for me... I'm not a, like a short rib person, I guess, but I know that the fried chicken is I great. I would try this it. This pesto mashed potato sounds amazing. Seasonal vegetables, dessert. Uh, desserts are always great. Fountain beverage sounds great. For children, by the way, $25. They get chicken tenders, mashed potatoes, vegetables, and a dessert with uh, milk or water. And you get a voucher to watch the parade and stuff. So, I, you know, it's not a bad deal. No, for a, for a reserved space and a dining package, price point this is not a bad price i don't think i think this is a a good deal because think about like hungry bear you get a reserved section for phantasmic this is kind of around that same price point so i don't think this is if you don't want the hassle of having to camp out to get a good spot and you just want to roll up a little bit before the parade starts Mm -hmm. you're going to eat dinner in the park anyway so this is i think this is a pretty good deal yeah Southern California has been dealing with quite a bit of rainy weather recently. Of course, like we said earlier, delaying magic happens, which can impact your day in the parks. If you plan on being in the park during rainy weather, be aware that outdoor attractions can and will close. Examples of these are Goofy Sky School, Alice in Wonderland, the Matterhorn, and more. Sometimes the weather is so bad that the park will close early, as what happened last week when Disneyland closed an hour early. If you can brave the weather, though, these are great days to go because the attractions that are running have very short lines. Yeah. So I was I was kind of looking and watching over the weekend and it seemed like the longest waits were like in the 30 minute range. But from what I was seeing, people that were at the parks, yes, it was posted 30 minutes, but it wouldn't actually be a, a true 30 minute wait. So things like Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway were like 20, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes. You weren't having hours long wait for some of these more popular attractions. Peter Pan, 20 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. And the nice thing is when these rates are lower, you're already inside. It's not like you're queued up outside of the show buildings sure. or, you know, you're in a covered space by the time that these queues get this short. So if you can brave it, get your rain boots on because Disneyland was not built for rain because it's Southern California. That's true. So you do have water issues and kind of like ginormous puddle issues happening too. But it's one of those things. I've never experienced Disneyland in the rain. And maybe it's because I've never done it that I just have this weird, I want to. I really want to experience Disneyland it's cool. in the rain. I just think I, it'd be a, much, a different experience. One of my favorite memories of Disneyland is in the rain, of going on what was then California Screaming in the rain and having the water like pelting you in the face. Oh, yes. Really yes, enjoyed yes. it. So, well. The wait has ended. The Food and Wine Festival is starting in just a couple of days. So, of course, the foodie guide is out. Some new items, along with returning favorites like the Mickey Mouse Snickers macaron, made the list. So many yummy things. And this beautiful foodie guide makes me sad that we do not not have a trip that coincides with the dates for the Food and Wine Festival. So I did not look at this until right now because I wanted to to save my excitement for the podcast and not get myself too excited. There's a lot of things here just in the pictures that look Mm -hmm. very yummy. And as usual, I'm going to fumble through while Teresa's like, oh, no, that's this thing. Because (laughs) see, for some reason, Teresa always knows what everything is. So what is what is this? Is this like a bruschetta? So that is the first one on the list there. That is the the petite petite burrata. Mm hmm. Grilled ciabatta with tomato and olive jam, burrata cheese, pesto, and freeze-dried balsam. It looks good. It looks yummy, and it is new. The one that really... There's a couple of things that caught my eye. Of course, had to check out the cold brew situation. Over at the Berry Patch, there is a blueberry pancake cold brew, which sounds kind of odd but kind of amazing at the same time it's joffrey's coffee and tea company mexican origin coffee brown butter maple syrup and a i'm going to say this wrong i apologize a demerara syrup and oat milk with a blueberry sweet cream made with cream oat milk vanilla syrup and puree and then garnish with cinnamon flavor cereal crumbles yum like never would i've thought blueberry pancake coffee I don't know. It makes sense, though. It sounds delicious. I wish I could try it. If someone here tries it, let us know what you think. There's a picture here that looks 
pretty good. It's an IPA sausage dog on a salt You know what's pretzel. hilarious? You always point out the this menu item. You oh, have it's not yet even to new try this it. Year. It's not even new. You well, always get so excited about the IPA sausage dog. It's the sausage dog. It's a soft pretzel roll, because I love soft pretzel rolls, on an onion, pepper, jardin, jardinier. I don't know what that is. Uh, cheddar cheese sauce and malt vinegar onion crunch. It sounds good. Mm-hmm. Over at Delish, um, another new offering is the beef and barley poutine, potato bites with braised beef short rib, yum, cheese curd stout gravy, and lager micro sponge. I'm not sure what, I hate that just, mm, it looks delicious. Here's another one of those drinks for you, a raspberry limoncello aid, grapefruit liqueur, house-made mm-hmm. mint syrup, raspberry <laughs> syrup, and lemon juice garlic with a white orchid. Yum. A couple of our favorites are coming back a garlic kiss. Of course, that's the grilled top sirloin with roasted garlic gruyere smashed potatoes and the carbonara garlic mac and cheese. Oh. So yummy. Okay. What is this? Is this is this thing here the this? Roast, yep. Okay. This looks it's so, good. Looks I don't know really why. Good. Roasted beet and goat cheese flatbread with basil pesto. It, now, it doesn't mm. sound very exciting when I just read it, but the photo they have here looks my mouth is watering looking at this photo i'm just there's, gonna be honest there's also over at i heart artichokes an artichoke pizzetta artichoke and roasted garlic Ooh. cream cheese with sun-dried tomatoes pickled onions and lemon olive oil drizzled microgreens Ooh, mm. that sounds good and then a few more of our favorites i'm just gonna quickly go through over at la style the glazed barbecue pork belly is back as well as the impossible euro inspired non both of those things i i had last year really enjoyed them and all and also over at peppers caliente the chili reano empanada that was oh, yeah. really really yummy okay the casita cucamonga has a strawberry horchata i know a house made rice and cinnamon beverage with strawberry oh. sauce that sounds really good oh <gasps> No. <laughs> no. Okay, before we get to Tag's panic attack here, I want to finish with the festival booths. The last festival booth is Avocado Time and their two actually their three everything is there is new except for purple glow cubes. They're the grape glow cubes. They have two entrees and a drink. They ha- and all of them sound delicious. I would just like this is my this would be my go to place. This sounds delicious. There's Impossible Nacho Mac and Cheese, which is a cheddar mac featuring seasoned Impossible ground beef, tomatoes, olives, jalapenos, and guacamole. There's also Impossible El Pastor Tacos. It's an El Pastor Taco and featuring Impossible pork with grilled pineapple. Oh, that'd be good. And avocado tomatillo sauce, and then. To wash it all down, you have a blackberry lavender lemonade, which is blackberry puree and syrup, lavender syrup, and pineapple and lemon juices garnished with a lemon wheel. Yum. Between that, so I'm very excited about those, even though we're not going and not trying it. I'm very excited about the cold brew. I'm really, I'm with you. I'm excited. This strawberry horchata sounds... Yum. I'm Sounds dying over here. So can I good. talk about the You thing can now? now talk about the Lamplight Lounge. Lamplight Lounge! Disney! Cookies and cream donuts are back. Fresh glazed donuts mm-hmm. topped with chocolate cookie crumble with vanilla and chocolate creme cookie dipping sauces. Why? I'm glad it's back, but we're not going to be there for it. I had Ugh. it last year. In fact, our server was Don't. super kind and made some Disney magic for Vern and I's wedding and gifted us an order of this. It was so yummy. So, so yummy. Okay. Um, But I am crazy excited about this. I don't know why the menu the menu sounds amazing but I think what's even cooler is Paradise Garden Grill everything that they are offering everything on the menu is plant based mm-hmm. I think that is so cool and they all we'll sound read good. through that they do they also I would Paradise Garden Grill is where it is at for these festivals the last several festivals that we have attended best food that we had of the like our favorite foods during the festival. Some of our favorites. I won't. I'll, I'll generalize it. Some of our favorites definitely came. From I will here. say every time that delicious. You you gravitate towards the plant based mm. offerings, and then when I taste yours, I always feel like I've made the wrong choice. That I should have got the plant based. Like, wait a minute, that's better. Yeah. So Paradise Garden Grill. We have the torta de chil- chilaquiles, fresh made mm-hmm. Tolera mm-hmm. bread with j- green chilaquiles. 
chorizo beans, chipotle crema, pickled onions, cilantro, and avocado spread. <sighs> Yum. There's bulgogi fried rice with kimchi, egg, pickled cucumbers, green onions, and sesame seeds. There's the impossible euro fries, which are waffle <laughs> fries topped with euro spiced impossible ground beef, cauliflower cheese sauce, tomatoes, cucumbers, onions, tzatziki, and pita bread. And also buffalo mac and cheese topped with roasted buffalo cauliflower ranch and a carrot and celery salad. And then um, not new, but is there is the peach blueberry cobbler, which is plant based dessert. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, I think we would try everything at that. One hundred percent. I would just say, yes, thank you. One of each, please. Yum. My goodness. And then it just tons, keeps going. And then there's tons of treats. And goodies kind of sprinkled throughout over at Terran Treats. There is a like a lemon raspberry pie churro, which is raspberry flavored spiral churro topped with a lemon and marshmallow glaze and pie crust crumbles. I was what just are, looking at these churro offerings? churros, but I, it doesn't say new, but I'm still confused because I don't remember this one. I There's a pineapple coconut churro. Of these, but there's been so many churros. With flavors. pineapple sugar, pineapple topping, coconut cream, icing, and toasted coconut. I would try that. That sounds good. I like coconut and a lot. over at the churro cart in Hollywoodland, there's a tiramisu churro, which is rolled in vanilla, cocoa sugar, and drizzled with espresso sauce. Now, all... So those two churros and the Terran Treat Spiral Churro, they do all have sip and savor tasting portions available. That's mm. pretty cool. Okay. For a full list of all the food and a lot of photos that's going to make you want to lick your computer screen, <laughs> visit the link in our show notes. Oh, yum. Well, let's just continue on uh, on this track. Disneyland After Dark Princess Nights are coming up soon, and the list of activities and food has been posted online. Some of the more elaborate parts of the night will include tea service at Cafe Orleans, mm-hmm. a cavalcade with Giselle twice per hour starting at 9, 15 p.m., and more Right. We talked about this during our live stream this weekend because it got leaked that, you know, what the I don't know, there wasn't I don't think there was an official announcement from Disney yet, but people had images of it looked like what the guide what the book. guide map or the guidebook was going to be for this, but it had the the menu on it and we were reading through it and I I tell you all of the people that bought tickets to go to Princess Night, I think you're in for a real treat. This is not something that when they announced it, I thought was fun and exciting. In fact, I didn't really, I mean, I don't know. I wasn't quite sure what to expect. I just wasn't overly thrilled about it. It wasn't a, oh, I need to go. But seeing all the stuff, seeing all the food, seeing all the, it just, I think it's going to be really fun. I do. I look forward to seeing and living vicariously through folks that are able to go and I can watch their like see their, you know, photos and videos and stuff like that. Yeah. So I just pulled up the thing. It's actually on Disney's site. Oh, it is on Disney's site. Yeah. See, it's their parksmedia.disney.com. Yeah. And so somebody just like found it, I guess, or whatever. But uh, where is it? I wanted to go down because the the tea thing does sound kind of interesting. The tea sounds really good. So the in Cafe Orleans, there's the prefix tea service menu with assorted selection of teas. So there's a short rib sandwich, caviar egg, crab avocado toast, Monte Cristo fritter, creole chicken, an apple pecan salad po' boy, crepe layer cake, blueberry almond scone, a strawberry shortcake, a strawberry chocolate cream puff. Mm. There's a plant-based tea service, which has impossible sandwich, roasted potato, avocado toast, ratatouille sandwich, cucumber and watercress salad sandwich, strawberry shortcake, fruit cobbler, chocolate raspberry bar, blueberry almond scone, and then the kids' tea service has a peanut butter and jelly, grilled cheese sandwich, meatball po' boy, assorted fruits and cream puff. Do you think that's all one sandwich, peanut butter and jelly? Yeah, comma. Grilled cheese sandwich, comma. So those are like two different things. Oh, you think it's two sandwiches, yeah, not they, all in it's, one? Yeah, it's, it's tea no, service. No, no, like I know. Tiny. But I, it's it's interesting that they only put sandwich behind grilled cheese and not behind. Yeah, I, that would be you weird. know what I mean. That's yeah, what I, I mean. That's... We had what was that like frozen guacamole on a stick thing at the Food and Wine Festival last year, and the mac and cheese that had peanut butter and jelly on it sure. too. So, anyways, the tea service at Cafe Orleans sounds amazing, but if you don't want to do the sit down service there, there's also all sorts of good sounding eats across the park. So, we'll start with Main Street. There's a Princess Sunday, which is blackberry peach and raspberry sorbet over at Gibson Girl Ice Cream Parlor. Moving on, there's also Jolly Holiday of course has treats because man, They've got the treats there. We have a Daydreamer macaroon, which is a raspberry coconut macaroon, and a Princess Trifle white chocolate mousse and mixed berry compote and vanilla cake. 
So at the refreshment corner, there's a curried beef hot dog and a cotton candy cream cheese Ooh. pretzel. This sounds delicious. I don't even know what it is. There's just a photo. There's no description. But the little red wagon, which is on the end of Main Street, kind of it's the by the dog yep, thing, isn't it? Yep, by the where Plaza Point is. If you've gone to Plaza Inn, you've gone too far. It's in between Plaza Point, the Holiday Shop, and Plaza Inn. But there's a mixed berry wagonade. Hmm. At the Plaza Inn, there's a Be Brave spicy chicken dinner and a honey barbecue chicken tenders. Over in Adventureland at Bengal Barbecue, there's a pineapple shrimp oh, skewer. That sounds good. At Harbor Galley, there's a mixed berry milk. Ooh. Ooh, Critter Country, you can find at Hungry Bear, Cajun honey glazed chicken and loaded steak fries and tea time lemon funnel cake with lemon sorbet. And this, both of these things sound amazing to me. They're, well, actually, all of them. Uh, at Red Rose Tavern, <laughs> there's the escargot flatbread. There's also a wild mushroom flatbread and a glowing strawberry sparkle tea. Yum. Tomorrowland at Galactic Grill, spicy huli huli loaded tenders and a royal sparkling lemonade. That royal sparkling lemonade looks gorgeous. It's purple. It does. At Alien Pizza Planet, we have a big slice pepperoni, a big slice cheese, and a cinnamon breadstick. So nothing. Way to go, LA. Alien Pizza Planet. Right. Um, over at the Tomorrowland pretzel cart, though, you can find a Mede- a macadamia nut pretzel. Ooh. And then churros of all the lands. <gasps> My okay, favorite. Teresa had one. So a blueberry cheesecake churro with blueberry cheesecake dipping sauce is at the It's a Small World and Fantasyland churro carts. That's the one that we had. Is that the one you licked the That's thing? the one that we had by the castle last spring when we were there in May. Oh, it was so yummy. If you haven't tried the blueberry cheesecake churro with blueberry cheesecake dipping sauce, do yourself a favor. Try it. This oh my episode gosh, has so gotten so good. many gasps from you and me about different mm-hmm. things. There's also the Berry Good Churro, which is at the Castle, Frontierland, and Tomorrowland Churro Carts. And finally, there's a Friendship Churro, which is rolled in raspberry limeade and pink lemonade sugars. And hmm. that's at New Orleans Square in Critter Country. Lemonade Churros. That's an interesting combo. Yeah. So it looks like it's a fun night for people that want to go. And, it uh... looks like a very fun film night. There's uh, way more things than I was like envisioning in my mind. So I'm very excited about this. Well, a new and somewhat controversial show is coming to the Hyperion at Disney California Adventure, Rogers the Musical, which was shown in the Disney Plus series Hawkeye. The musical was a fictional Broadway show inspired by the life of the first Captain America, Steve Rogers. No word on when the show will debut, but we are guessing for this summer. So I will say it's controversial because there's people that are excited about it and people that are... Not excited what, about it. That's what what's camp are you in, Teresa? I'm in the I'm in the confused camp. <laughs> That's where I am. And I'll just say we talked about this again this weekend. So I apologize if you listen to the live stream. You already heard me rant about this. So I'll keep my soapbox short. I think it's a very fun thing for that small group of fans. I think outside of that small group of fans, it might be a little confusing. I'm thinking about. Like when we were there last year for the wedding and we were there with all of our different with our family mm-hmm. trying to explain Rogers the musical to to that group would have been hard because if you and even other fans that I know that enjoy Marvel, but they aren't the Marvel fan that's watching every single one sure. of the Disney Plus series. They d- they don't know what Roger they don't know what this is so I think it's just a little confusing. Am I happy that something's back in the Hyperion Theater? One hundred percent, yes. But am I also happy that this is that Disney has said that this is just a short time release of this and that Rogers the Musical is not like permanent here to stay? Yes, I'm also happy about that. I thought that this was going to be a great addition to the Hyperion only because of the fact that they've talked about over the years now that. Avengers Campus would like kind of slowly take over Hollywood land. Have they actually confirmed that or have people speculate? But, they, but they've installed things. That, um, but the thing that confuses me with that is we have a Captain, the Captain America shield yep. is over there. We had Captain Marvel's jet, but that's now been removed. Yep. And then Spider Man used to meet and greet in front of that little backdrop there. However, since Avengers Campus opened, Spider Man's meeting and greeting over. In front of like his sh- the show, yep. the Spider Man show, yep. and same thing. Captain America, Steve Rogers, Captain America is in. He's meeting and greeting in Avengers Campus. So those yep. are kind of just photo drops. Right now, the 
Spider-Man backdrop is being used um, for Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur. So it's Moon Girl's meet and greet spot now. Yeah. I'm just thinking that that was that was the plan there for a little while. So I thought the the a good way to like bridge that is you have to have something Marvel in there. And I can't really see a Broadway caliber show like we had with Aladdin or like the shows they've done in the past with like Lion, not in the High Pyramid in general, like Lion King, mm-hmm. Beauty and the Beast, etc. And so I just don't see like a Marvel version of that. So the best, the next best thing is this thing that they kind of like was kind of like a spoof almost. So I think the more, like you said, I think the Marvel fans that saw it, like will find it amusing to go yeah. watch it. And I think people will find it different if nothing else, like the, they, they might come out confused, but I think they'll still kind of enjoy it potentially. But I also think that you will quickly exhaust the amount of people who yeah. like, I don't think people are going to go see this multiple times. Mm-hmm. I would definitely go see it. Cause I think oh. I, would go to look to kind of like giggle at it kind of a thing but i wish that they would bring something back akin to you know aladdin or something like that Mm -hmm. where we can i i don't want them necessarily bring back aladdin i just want something that is on par with aladdin i'm holding out hope still for either a stage production of like coco or now in content i think both of those would be beautiful i think so too we'll see but i mean i'm confused I should clarify. I'm confused by the choice because I think it does. I don't understand how it makes sense for like all like the average theme park guest. But will I go see Rogers? Yes, I will 100 percent go and see Rogers the musical probably just once because I think like you, I would be uh, see experience it once and then be okay with it. That's how I felt about the Frozen show that was in there. Like I saw it once and I was good. I didn't need to see it again. It didn't seem like there was anything to bring me back where like Aladdin, I went back and back and back because the genie, there was always new jokes and Mm -hmm. always new things. So whatever they do, they need to have that element to it, I think. And I don't know what else will work well with that, but I hope they find something. You know, but what's interesting is I think you were so off topic right now. I apologize. I think you just weren't a fro. You didn't. You weren't a fan of Frozen, so it didn't. It wasn't repeatable for you because it was because it was Frozen. But like the Lion King show that's back at Fantasy, the Fantasyland Theater, or like Mickey's and Mickey and the Magical Map, those were the same exact that's show, true. start to end. That's true. But we enjoyed you know seeing those multiple times. So they just have to have a one of those. Ones that just pulls at your heartstrings yeah. and just pulls you back in. I think the music, man, Coco and Kanto, mm-hmm. I think they're really, really leaving, like, I, I won't say money on the table because you're not buying tickets for it. But yeah. I really think that they're passing up a really golden opportunity to put one of those things I, in there. I, I have a, like, weird tingle that, like, a little spidey sense kind of thing. <laughs> I just think, I mean, come on, Lin-Manuel Miranda and Kanto the Hyperion. It's like a trifecta. Like, yep. you, I mean, come on. This is what the, the man puts together Broadway shows. He did the music for this super popular yep. music or the super popular movie. You have the space. I feel like I, that's that to me. That makes the most sense. We'll see if that actually happens or we'll not. We'll find out. Well, the Disney Vacation Club Tower at the Disneyland Resort is coming along this week. Disney showed off a first look at the new guest rooms coming to the villas at the Disneyland Resort. The 12 story tower will open in September with themed rooms celebrating Disney animation. There is a size for almost everyone from studios to a two story, 12 person grand villa. If I had tons of money just kind of laying around with nothing, you know, need. And so I would become a Disney Vacation Club member just because of these rooms. They're beautiful. If you have a chance, if you haven't already, link, of course, is in our show notes to the Disney Parks blog article on this that has photos of the different, you know, concepts for the rooms. And there, I want, can this be my house? Like, I would decorate my house like this. They're gorgeous. I just, I, I love it. I love I the just artwork. Can't get over this two story villa. Oh, that's, that's basically crazy. like four hotel rooms yeah. in one kind of a At thing. least four. At the top with a balcony. Giant. And, yeah. Yeah. Giant balcony, giant outdoor living space. It's, it's, it'd be cool. Could you imagine, like, I don't know, having like a family reunion or some big fun something? Like, maybe if like that would have been open for the wedding. And again, I just had tons of money laying around sure. needing something to do. That would have been a cool, that would have been so cool. I mean, I if know. you have tons of money later, I was needing something to do. I'll gladly take it from you. But <laughs> I yes. just, I just love it. There's a so some of the rooms. If you haven't seen it, or we'll give you a little teaser. There's a Jungle Book themed like room. So you've got Baloo, 
on like the headboard and there's I don't know there's cause in there too but it's cool because there's like this beautiful painting but then there's also this kind of in between where it sketches and some of it's in color this kind of like in between I don't know the color in this room is gorgeous there's the sleeping beauty room I think they teased this at destination this room at destination D mm. and I got all excited about it but it, it's giving me Mary Blair inspired and vibes whether that I'm sure that was intentional again but it's gorgeous and then this other room room has some princess and the frog theming going on too we've got a mural with tiana on it but then on the entertainment center there's like this fun little design but it's got lily pads wo- like woven into the sure. design i just i just think they're beautiful and so fun yay and high fives to anybody that gets to stay in these rooms because yeah. i don't we don't have that much money lying around to be able to do it but they're Gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. Well, one of our favorite places to eat at the resort should be opening their expansion really soon. Earl's Sandwich Tavern is the other section of the old La Brea Bakery that hosted the sit-down restaurant. The menu has been released for the location, which includes entrees like prime rib, fish tacos, and spaghetti and meatballs, along with starters, soups, salads, sandwiches, and desserts. For the complete menu, of course, check out the link in the show notes. So I don't know why. I I don't know what I expected Earl of Sandwich Tavern to have, because Earl of Sandwich has always been to me like sandwich, right? Like sandwiches. And there are sandwiches here for sure. Quick grab and go kind of sandwiches. So I'm looking and I saw like roasted Prime rib of beef. So, like, you can get a prime yeah. rib dinner. Yeah. Chicken fettuccine Alfredo. A slow roasted chicken. Like, there's so many things in here that you can get. And so, I'm excited that there's uh, a variety of things to eat there. And it also doesn't seem outrageously priced, especially for downtown Disney. None of the things on this menu. I was not expecting this menu at all. I was like you. Because we know Earl of Sandwich for like you said, the grab and go sandwiches. If you would have showed me this menu and not told me that this was the Earl of Sandwich Tavern, I would not have guessed sure. that this was the Earl of Sandwich Tavern menu because even the sandwiches that they have listed are not sandwiches that are on their regular, you know, their, I, I, I don't even know what to call the other menu, menu. but the other menu, they're not even on, there's like a downtown burger, there's a chimichurri steak sandwich, a mac and cheese burger, you know, different stuff there. There's desserts, I don't know. I'm like, I'm I'm excited, but also a little confused by it. Because again, I think when I think Earl, I don't think like sit down, nice big meal things. I sure. think like grab and go deliciousness. Yeah, it'll be interesting. I'm I I think that I'm still probably going to go the sandwich route with them because mm-hmm. their sandwiches are just their sandwiches so are really freaking good. good and priced really really well. So the sandwiches for the sit down tavern menu range from 22 to 26 dollars and the entrees range from 24 dollars up to 38 dollars. So it is a little definitely more spendy than the Earl of Sandwich right. that we are Accustomed used to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, used to going to, but it's another option for downtown Disney. The thing that's also interesting to me is this is a temporary location. So I'm kind of surprised that they're doing this much and adding this much with the temporary location. So I'm curious to see if the tavern menu is kind of a sneak peek of what the new location sure. at downtown Disney for the new and the new permanent home for down yeah. for Earl in downtown Disney. If this is going to, if this is included or what, cause this just seems like a little extra for a temporary pop-up spot that they've got going now. This whole thing, we're getting off topic a little bit here, but this whole thing just seems weird to me that like, okay, I understand taking part of the La Brea bakery section and making it like, you know, Earl of sandwich, you know, throw a sandwich from there. No big deal. But then adding this whole aspect of stuff that they didn't do before, Part of me just wants to be like, can you just leave it there, like, and build yeah. whatever? Maybe you're put gonna Portos on the put other Portos side. Portos in or the something. new building down there and leave Earl because Earl seems happy in this spot. Yeah. I don't know. It's I, interesting. Well, it is interesting. It is very interesting. It just seems like they're putting a lot of time and effort and money into this location that is going to be gone in the next couple of years. Mm-hmm. It just seems strange to me. That's all. There's just something odd about it that I feel like there's something else going on. But I could be totally wrong. DL Weekly announces the boarding of the Trivia Express, nonstop star speeder service to the moon of Endor. All passengers, please prepare for immediate boarding. Hello and welcome to Trivia Land. How are you two feeling today? 
Did you just switch notepads to write our trivia yeah, answers on? Yeah, because okay. I actually brought this one over for you to use for, because you always would grab stuff to write notes when we have interviews. So that's oh. One. This one was the one that we had been using. Gotcha. For that's uh, great. I'm doing well, too. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing well. We're doing well, James. Uh, I, I, We, yeah. We'll see how it goes. Yeah, exactly. It'll be fun. Let's jump right into it. Our first question. You got a 50-50 shot. It's a true or false. Woo! The partner statue of Walt Disney is actually one inch taller than the real Walt Disney. Oh. That is a deep sigh for the first question. That's, ooh. False. I'm going to say false. That's hard to, like, I have no reason to say this since we got to see the partner statue at the studios and stand next to it. But I was like, it's hard to tell, like, height wise. You know what I mean? Yeah. I almost felt like maybe it was, maybe it's an inch shorter yeah. and so that's why i'm saying false i'm 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 leaning false too all right i'm gonna take you both down as false we're moving on to question number two and this is an audio question name the attraction please it said you're all wet it said my 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 you're all wet hmm well, I don't think it's Splash Mountain, no. so the only other thing you get really wet on is Grizzly River, is Run. Grizzly River Run, but I don't remember there being any audio that goes along with it. Maybe that's why we don't remember this clip. <laughs> 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 I'm going with Grizzly. What else, what else do you get wet on? There's nothing else you get wet on, right? Some people get, depending, you could get so you know splashed when you're on Pirates, you get misted on when you're in the Jungle Cruise. I mean, what's your definition of like, you mean like when you're like drenched? <laughs> I'm I'm going back. I'm going to say Splash Mountain because it does kind of sound like it has a... No, no. Something to uh, it. No. There's so much music on Splash Mountain. You think that there's only a oh, voice? Oh, that's true. Ah, uh, no. All right. I'll stick with Grizzly River Run. All right. All right. Sticking with it, locking it in, and moving on to our third question from listener Tara F., there are lots of fun car puns at Flo's V8 Cafe, like the Automatic 100 Tabletop Jukebox Music Selector, where you can flip through dozens of Moto Rama Girls' best songs, mm-hmm. including a parody to which e-ticket attraction. A parody to an e-ticket attraction? This is in Cars Land, you said? In Cars Land at Flo's V8 Cafe. And if you need a really helpful hint, it's number 15 out of the Automatic 100. <laughs> Cars Land is full of these punny parodies. If it's an e-ticket... The, o- the only thing I can think of would be It's a Small World, because that is like the most like... Oh. If you think of a song from an attraction, that's the one that everybody... No, but what? I'm just gonna I don't think throw that was an e-ticket, Big though. Thunder Mountain, because I think Big Thunder Mountain's an e-ticket, and it seems like it would fit with the Southwest kind of oh, sure. theming. That's a good... Yeah. That's a good road to go down. Oh, 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 I see what you did there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to stick with It's a Small World, even though I don't think that's right. That I, would be funny. That's like the only thing I think of. Feeling the punny jokes in there. I like it. All right. Our last question this week. Which attractions have in-ride photos? Ooh. Splash. So, hang on. Hang on. Let's let's like go through the whole thing. Are you talking about both both parks? Both parks. We have Space Mountain. Where are we you have... starting from? I don't know. She's the front go- of the park. She's going to the right. <laughs> the way to the go around the park. The front of the park. The I feel like space, space is space the closest. Mountain, but yes, you're Buzz right. Buzz Lightyear. Buzz Lightyear. Oh, Buzz Lightyear. gosh. That terrible That thing. terrible one. Buzz. I don't think there's anything else in Disneyland. Uh, there's the Incredicoaster. Yeah. I was still... We're, <laughs> Disneyland still. Disneyland. Anything... Are we missing anything in Disneyland? Because there's nothing in Galaxy's Edge. Nothing in Galaxy's Edge. Nothing in Toontown. Nothing nothing in Fantasyland. Frontierland. Okay. Yeah, I think that's it. Because in Disney World, they have one in Pirates, but we don't have Uh that. And we don't have any Uh pictures on any attractions in Adventureland. We don't have that crazy picture going down Main Street on the Omnibus or anything. No, yeah. (laughs) The Incredicoaster. There is not one for Grizzly. There is not one for Soren. Not one for monsters. Guardians. Oh, Guardians. Yeah. Radiator Springs. Takes that one well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. Radiator Springs. I think that's it. How many total? There's not one. Like Star Tours, you just have the spy, but you don't actually have like an yeah, attraction photo. Yeah, it's not like an photo. attraction photo, yeah. That, I think that's it. Can you give me your list just so yep. I'm sure? Yep. Space Mountain, Splash Mountain, Buzz Lightyear, The Incredicoaster, 
Guardians, and Radiator Springs Racers. Excellent. All right. That's a, quite a list. We got some photos to sort through to see if you've been on all these attractions, right? We'll find I out. I feel like there should be more, but I can't think of it. Like, that's a short list. <laughs> Disney World has yeah, a lot. Yeah, Disney World's got a ton. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we got a pretty short list. If it's the right list, we'll find out soon. Mm-hmm. But first, this week's discussion topic. So when I when I was working there, it was right after the 50th anniversary of the park and nobody knew what the nobody cared about the Jungle Cruise. I mean, in Adventureland, everybody was all about Indiana Jones. That's all that mattered. And we talked about a a little bit about this on the other uh, other show. But there was a time where the Jungle Cruise was set to be closed and it was going to turn into a way to transport people over to the Temple of the Forbidden Eye. So essentially, the Jungle Cruise was going to stop being an attraction, and it was just going to be transportation from point A to point B to get you kind of immersed into Indiana Jones. That's how unpopular the Jungle Cruise That's was. Crazy. Yeah. Oh, it was it was ludicrous. Do you, so do you know with that, do you know, did you ever or have you seen since? How, how are they going to do that? Because I don't like... It's not that far, and it's an awful long way for the river, for the boat to go all the way back around to go back to the dock to pick people up to just take them over to the temple. You know what I mean? Like, so, I don't even yeah. understand how that would have worked. Well, I mean, obviously, they saw the same problems. Oh, that's so good. that's yeah. that's why it didn't get the axe. But, yeah, essentially, from my understanding, I think Tony Baxter's first original ideas were to drop them. And I don't think that Tony Baxter ever wanted to, to axe the Jungle Cruise. Sure, I think yeah. that it was him seeing an opportunity that they were going to just, like, level the Jungle Cruise and him seeing the opportunity to keep it alive in some sort of capacity. Sure. Sure. But they were going to drop you off, essentially, I mean, the, the Q area area was going to be way different originally but think about where you where you queue up by the giant snake statues outside that lower level queue area that's where it was going to drop you off and that's kind of where your queue experience was going to start was right in that area hmm. Hmm. interesting yes so so yeah the uh again people didn't really care too much about the jungle cruise they they didn't even a lot of people didn't even realize that it was an actual ride i mean i was telling you guys really? last time that i would uh, multiple times a day i would have somebody sit right next to me on the boat and we'd get halfway through and they'd be like wait this isn't indiana jones <laughs> Like they legit thought that they were getting on Indiana wow. Jones and they just went into the queue. And so we as skippers, I mean, that's the thing is you never meet a Jungle Cruise skipper who was truly a quote unquote Jungle Cruise skipper who uh, who was half hearted about this, the jungle. Like yeah. there is something <laughs> that happens when you become a skipper that it's a it's this fraternity that you become part of the fraternal order of the skipper. And it's. It for better or for worse, it could have been it could be really toxic at times, like very, very like almost hazy in certain ways, which was gross to me. But thankfully, we kind of transcended that. But skippers loved the Jungle Cruise, just loved the Jungle Cruise, obsessed about the Jungle Cruise, which you don't really hear that about Pooh or Splash right. Mountain <laughs> right. or yeah. Yeah, any of these other attractions. But we there's only one other attraction now that I think about it that that we had a huge rivalry with, but also obsessed over their attraction. And it's not one that you would ever think. I want you guys to see if you can guess which attraction obsessed over themselves and like their quote unquote superiority. You'll never guess it. <laughs> I've heard that. Is there it was... in Disneyland? It is. Okay. I've heard that there was something with Storybook Land, but I feel like people get. Very... I always thought the girls on Storybook Land were so cute, and they used to try to take <laughs> our jokes, and so we would go over and ride and kind of like chide them for it. It's not Storybook. It's not Storybook. <laughs> is it the canoes? That's my other guess. It's the canoes. I was <laughs> going to say canoes. because the can the canoes because Disney suits are not going to go ride the canoes. <laughs> I feel like they have some off OG stuff that they say. Oh, yes. And we They're we started so riding the canoes regularly uh-huh. a few trips ago because we were like, this is like the Jungle Cruise in level of like funniness. Like yep. when I went on it when in the 90s, it was just like, and stroke, and exactly. stroke. <laughs> exactly. But they were this all is about like not falling funny. out of the boat. <laughs> yeah. But now they're funny. Mm-hmm. And you know where that came from? The rivalry. 
because really? we yeah we would always we would get the laughs and we would we would get so mad because they would make jokes on the and we're like we are the funny ones in, in this side of the park. Like, it was so hilarious and so ridiculous. But yes, there was a huge rivalry between the two, the two river rides. And they, cause we always saw, they were like the jocks and we were the loser freaks. And so they're walking through the park doing like their hut, 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 hut sort of thing. Like they're all just in a line, single file. And we were just like, Oh, here they come. It's the Abercrombie crew. <laughs> and, and we were all just the, the hanging out in the corner, just being nothing. That's what we loved about the, the jungle cruises. It had just a feeling of pure punk rock. It's like, nobody wants us here. Nobody knows that we're here. And as a result, but we're the only ones who realize how awesome this is. And as a result, we're just going to have a blast. And so that's what we did. And it was legit like summer camp every single day. We'd be cracking jokes at each other. We'd be playing off of each other's jokes. We would be doing just the goofiest stuff to try to get each other to laugh. It was a ton of fun. And I don't know what it was, truthfully, that finally tipped it over the edge for people to finally start filling up the Jungle Cruise. But truthfully, it was it was around the time that we started the podcast, The Backside of Water, back in like 2015 is when Jungle Cruise really started to pick up in popularity again. Because earlier than that, there never was a line. I mean, I I actually proposed to my wife on the Jungle Cruise because it was so unpopular that we could take a boat out by ourselves during the fireworks, and I could wow, propose yeah. in the middle of the jungle to her because nobody wanted to ride it. And that was back in 2013. So, wow. It, yeah. yeah. Actually, what a magical proposal. That's pretty... Oh. I mean, no, there's like probably less than a handful of people that can say they had that experience. It was incredible. That's incredible. Her favorite time was the fireworks. My favorite ride was the Jungle Cruise. So I figured let's mold, meld those two together. And it's crazy because the skipper that took us out just like last year, I'm on a Facebook group with skippers and I posted that and I was like, happy anniversary. And somebody tagged him and he was like, I was stoked to do that with you guys. How did you even pull that off? Did you pull him off to the side and be like, <clears throat> or did you just try and time it well that you were the only two on the boat? Yeah, that's a great question. So my friend Kelly Small, who she actually just quit this last week she was my skipper contact there and i was like kelly i want to do this so i'd like to come in through the exit and i would love for us to have a private boat out into the jungle during the fireworks and she was like okay come over at 9 32 and so we went over at 9 32 and my wife totally knew what was going on because i was just like oh, okay we gotta go to the we gotta, no no we can't go we can't go on that ride we gotta be over here by 9 32 and so she totally knew what was going on and so that's how we were able to do it because again it was it, there's there's certain benefits to knowing people who work at the park i'm not gonna lie that's one of the best <laughs> best parts. awesome oh yeah that's amazing. awesome. So how long were you a skipper and what else did you do at Disney? Yeah. So so I didn't work there a ton. I worked there a little under a year and a half. So I wasn't there a super long time. But during that time, it was my goal to. So I, I originally was like, OK, I'm only going to work here six months and then I'm going to go back to the <laughs> real world. And and it just kept extending longer and longer. But I started out working Jungle Cruise, and then at 90 days, at your 90-day window, you were able to cross-train. And so the moment I hit 90 days, management came over to me and was like, we want you guys, we want you to come over to Big Thunder Mountain. And so with Big Thunder Mountain, with the, with the bad accident that happened there in the early 2000s, mm -hmm. it was a very, very tense location, very tense, very serious, very professional yeah. in the way that we had to do things and i wasn't stoked unlike about the going. jungle cruise exactly yeah, that sounds exactly very different. yeah very different from one another and if i'm being completely honest i wasn't excited to go over to big thunder mountain because i'm like no I'm, I'm i'm here for the jungle party <laughs> um and so the way that they the way they they roped me in is they said alex <laughs> if you if you become a, a Big Thunder miner, that's one step closer to becoming a jungle trainer. And I was like, oh, you know how to get me. You know how to get me. So so I took the job over as a Big Thunder Mountain miner with the hopes of that leading to me becoming a jungle cruise skipper trainer. And then I also cross-trained. And when you become a jungle cruise skipper, you also automatically learn, again, here's something that people don't even realize. The Tiki Room 
was such a dumb attraction to people back in the in the mid 2000s. Everybody hated Tiki. They were like nobody wanted to work it. Nobody wanted to do anything about it. Really? Everybody wanted Tiki to close. Oh. They were like, it's time to move on. I went in there and I was like, I, so to be completely transparent, I had never been in the Tiki <laughs> room before I worked at Disneyland. Oh, wow. Wow. And yes. And my friend, Bethany Thomas, who, who was one of my closest friends there. So Bethany was the one who actually was like, Alex, you've never been in the Tiki room. How can this be? And I was like, well, I just never got the chance. And she was like, we're changing that today. So she actually took me on the Jungle Cruise or excuse me, on, and it changed my life. I was like, this is incredible. And with that, <laughs> I fell in love with the Tiki Room and every opportunity I could get to get on a shift with the Tiki Room, I took. And I, I have so many vivid memories of being in the tiki room and reading Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets while Jose is <laughs> is doing his thing out there and it was it was just amazing. So I did Tiki Room and again that's another one that people are shocked by because Tiki is such like a cult classic now yeah. but everybody wanted Tiki done. They were like let's move on from this. So thankfully Tiki will never disappear and Jungle won't either. And then finally after my time on uh, Big Thunder Mountain, at my 90-day mark, it was actually, don't tell anybody, but it was like day 75. <laughs> my manager, who was awesome, said, you've been wanting to go do Opera House, so I got your cross train to Opera House. Now, at the time, Opera House was all about the history of Disney. And so people would come in, and we would talk about the history of Disneyland and how Walt Disney developed everything in Disneyland. So that's truly what actually got me very excited about the historical elements of the park. So those were the main things that I worked throughout the entire time. And then every once in a while, I would still work a parade here and there. And then I became a Disney University trainer. So I would train people in what was called line of business training. So it was really dull back, back of house stuff that I would be like, okay, this is how you stay in your green zone. This is how you stay in your yellow zone. Don't strain your elbows, everybody. So <laughs> I would do those types of things. And then this is the crazy thing. So I... I finally got trainer. I got Jungle Cruise trainer. Like I went and did all of the different steps and they were like, you're a Jungle Cruise trainer. And I quit two weeks later. Oh, <laughs> I'll bet you they were very upset with you. They, they put like, all that what? effort into you. You know, I don't think they actually were. I think that they understood that like it was it was the perfect opportunity for me to go back to school to become a teacher. And so I kind of laid it out that way. And I was like, guys, I'm yeah. really sorry, but this is just, this is, this is the way that I need to make it happen. And they were super understanding and I still have a positive rehire status with Disney. So I can nice. go back anytime and get my job that I hope that I get paid the same that I did then, which was seven ninety two <laughs> an hour. You hope you get paid that. <laughs> I hope they froze You know, that don't say that too. too loud. The Disney might take you up on it. They're like, yeah, it's exactly. a deal. It's <laughs> like, a deal. A Come on back. <laughs> Man, that's incredible. So there's like so much to unpack there. I feel like we have to have you back sometime to just dive into the Tiki Room. Oh, I, yes. I love that. We can talk about the Opera House a little bit. I love that that used to be Big more Thunder. A, I want to talk about Big Thunder eventually. Oh, yeah. also Big Thunder too. But I just, I didn't, I've never experienced the Opera House as it being more of a like, education you know where it was more yeah. interactive yeah. with the hosts that are there i mean i've had great conversations with them but it feel it doesn't feel like that's you know that they're just interested and they're like oh you know and they just kind yeah. of come up and yeah. chat to you not not like that was what the experience was supposed to be that's and that really was cool. the intention and that was the cool stuff is like we would have imagineers coming in on a regular basis talking to us tony baxter would come down on his on his time off and he would just come talk to us about the updates that they're doing to the park so we could share that with guests i mean golly so cool. that that dude that dude is like he is Disney, like he is Disney incarnate. A lot of people put guys like Joe Rody up on a pedestal. Tony Baxter puts Joe Rody to shame when it comes to especially the pure devotion to Disneyland that Tony Baxter had. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is if I'm being completely honest, after Walt Disney, Disneyland is Tony Baxter's park. There's yeah, no question I mean, about yeah. that. Ugh. Look at look and, at look at all the things that he's done. I mean, Indy. <laughs> Indy, Thunder, Thunder Splash Mountain, Splash. Tomorrowland Refurbish. I mean, uh, basically yeah. 
Star everything. Tours. Yep, everything is is Tony Baxter's little little baby in that area, and but see, I don't that's know if- what they need. They they need Imagineering needs each each park. I'll even say yeah. like oh, each yeah. each resort needs somebody who grew up, and that is like it's it's they want the best for the park because like that's their happy place. Mm-hmm. Oh, for and sure. I feel like we've gotten to this point. Where I mean, Joe Rody was that for Animal Kingdom, right? Like, yes. he had a vision for that. That was his park, and so. But I feel like well, right now we got Kim Irvine, yeah, Kim who I think Irvine. is I think kind of doing, doing a, that. Yeah, she's doing a fit. Look at the castle repaint that mm-hmm. she oversaw, and yeah. Enchanted Wish. I think those were just done really mm-hmm. well, and I'm excited about the treehouse, which is what well, we chat about with the Did You Know Diz podcast. Yes, out, so. and I will say this: I also think it's interesting because the Magic Kingdom has now become. A more of a historical heritage park. Mm-hmm. I mean, 20 years ago, it was still fairly fresh. And so you didn't have a lot of deep rooted history. And and when I say heritage, I mean, a lot of Imagineers who grew up with that as their experience for their park. And now that we have that, you're going to see the same love and adoration for Disneyland that a lot of people had mm-hmm. start to show up even more on a nostalgia basis with the Magic Kingdom, and I say bring it on. I'm stoked yeah. to see that happen down there. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, so I hope we can, I hope Disney can get some people a good replacement, uh, or not replacement, nobody's ever going to replace Tony Baxter, but a good kind of next generation of a Tony mm-hmm. Baxter kind of person, because Kim Irvine, she's getting up there too. I mean, she's going to retire at some point. Yeah. Um, so I'm interested to see who the next wave and the next generation of Imagineers are, because you know that there's somebody probably in the ranks or mm-hmm. shortly will be that's that's going to start making a name for themselves because Joe rody has gone now. Tony Baxter's retired. Mm-hmm. Kim Irvine probably will retire in the next oh, 10 years at the most, I would Kevin say. Rafferty's yeah. one. Kevin Rafferty. Yeah. Who is the guy who just left? The the main guy. Uh, why can't I think of his name? Oh, Bob Weiss. Bob Weiss. Yeah. So like, there's all of these people that that came up in the company as like the second generation people after the original Imagineers. I don't know. I'm I I I think you're right. I think, but Tony Baxter. I'd love to have him on the podcast sometime. Yeah, I think he's elusive. Be fascinating. He's very elusive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he's like trying but to I catch think, a, a bubble or something. Yes, but exactly. I, <laughs> but I think Tony Baxter is one of those people that if you ever got him, he would probably s- s- talk for hours and hours. No question. No question. And because, so I feel and like it's we not would to just like inflate his ego. Yeah, exactly. No, yeah, it's not to inflate it. He's he's just stoked about it. Which my question for you guys is: Do you think now that there's been a, an upset of the uh, the corporate apple cart, do you guys think Imagineering's actually going to move down to Orlando, or do you think it's staying put? I I hope it stays put, but I I think the seen... damage has already been done. Yeah, I th- yeah I think they were maybe too far down that road to fully turn that around so i, I i've heard rumors to stay put, i've heard rumors that it's but, not ugh. too far down the road i've i've heard actually yeah. a lot of the exact opposite that there's now i mean they've they've inevitably just delayed it they originally said that it was going to be until 2026 and now they're like we don't know when it's going to happen mm-hmm. and i think that now with Iger back at the helm I think they're going to put it back in Burbank if I'm if I'm a betting man. But, so. but really what do you so. think's going to happen with the Iger situation? Like he's supposed to be back for two years. Yeah. What do you foresee going I on? I see there? Josh it's tomorrow like... becoming CEO. Whether people like that or not, I see Josh tomorrow picking up where where Iger left off. That's that's my personal hot take on it. He's got the face for it. He's basically mini Iger in a lot of ways mm-hmm. with with he's the got way charisma. That, Oh, without a doubt, he's got the look. He's he's got the look that gets the touch, as they say. I don't know what that. I don't remember what that commercial was from. It was like L'Oreal or something like that. But, but you um, know what, though, they need Disney. Well, first of all, I've said this a hundred times, so I won't beat it to death. But Disney needs a creative and a financial to work together oh, yeah. at the top and make it happen. And they haven't had that for a while. But the other thing I think is I miss. And maybe we've just moved on in our culture from this, I guess, maybe. But I personally want Grandpa Walt or Grandpa Eisner or Mm. like, you know, because they both Mm. were the face of Disney. And and Michael Eisner, you know, he'd come out and, hi, I'm Michael Eisner, president and CEO of the Disney. Yeah. (laughs) And he'd like, and he like, he would show you behind the scenes and he'd play with the animated characters like they were there and everything, right? Mm -hmm. And Have you guys read Disney War? 
by James B. Stewart. Not yet. Ja- it's Teresa on my has it. Shelf. Oof, looking oof. at it. <laughs> Drop what you're doing and start it now because it is fascinating. But the thing is, is we'll have to add we that to need book club list. We yes. need one of those. We need somebody. I think Josh could maybe do it. That's like. Hello, welcome to Wonderful World of Disney. We're going to talk about this today. And like, Iger never really did that. Well, and Iger didn't do that as a direct response to Eisner. So, right. I mean, when when you look at it, Eisner was so in the face of the public that at one point he really did kind of the king went mad with power in a lot of ways that he was like, I am Walt. And it was this ego driven thing that happened towards the end. And if it wasn't for California Adventure knocking him down a few pegs as far as his belief in his own success, we probably wouldn't have seen a change in that trajectory. But Iger came in right after that and said he has been nothing but the public face. We need to actually make the company the public face of this Mm -hmm. instead of having a figurehead with this because that's the way to perpetuate this thing coming down the line. And so that was kind of Iker's approach was a direct response against that. But I don't, I I see it being successful. And I mean, we see we see Steve Jobs. I mean, Steve Mm -hmm. Jobs was Apple. Walt Disney was Disney. Are we going to, but here's the question that I have for you guys. Do you think that that's possible by a non-founder? Do you think that somebody who didn't found yeah. and create it is yeah. able to step up into that role? It, I think yeah. it's much harder to do for sure. For well, sure. I think I think Michael Eisner did it. I still think that there was a I don't know. I don't know. I feel like with Michael Eisner, there was a little bit of a, a, a dissonance there, at least hmm. from my opinion. I think that because, again, I look at it as kind of like the Tim Cook feel that now that Tim Cook runs Apple, nobody's like, oh. I'm going to make a, a phone well, case with Tim Cook's face on it. Nobody does that, with, but everybody still with, does. But the thing with Tim Cook is like he's a brilliant, you know, pipeline guy, right? And yeah. he's a good business person. But when you, I mean, we, I listen to a lot of Apple tech podcasts and everybody always makes fun of good morning. Like he's just a robot. <laughs> yeah, he totally is. Like you watch him at the keynotes and you're like, he's like, we have a, an amazing lineup of things today to talk about. And then he gives it to other people because they're much better in front of people. The the Craig Federici... Uh, I'm going to go down a whole Apple thing. Craig <laughs> Federici. Craig Federici. I could watch him all day. He doesn't take himself seriously. He makes jokes like, yeah. and they, they use... And, and he's hilarious. Without and a doubt. And he's the type of person that needs to lead more things because people find that entertaining. But I well, think sorry. Disney... Oh, I was just going to say, I don't want to beat this, but I also... One thing that I want to... I, I really really hope I want you guys to read Disney War soon because <laughs> there is so much that unpacks in Disney War because what we look at too is during the Eisner years Eisner tried to be the face of the company but who ended up actually being the voice of the company was Roy Disney. Mm -hmm. Roy Mm. Disney was always there. And that was one of the big things that you see was a sticking point with Eisner is he never, he never outshined Roy Disney. And he resented that because Roy had the family power. When you heard Roy's voice, you heard Walt. And when you saw Roy, you saw well, he looked Walt. like him. Yeah, he he exactly. Like Walt, exactly. Like what I would like to see going forward is maybe not have like the one person that's a figurehead have different mm. people representing different things, which I think Apple their, has been you know, good at their stuff. to bring that back up. I think yeah. Apple's doing really well with that. Do you think? Well, and I think that we so, also see like with there's there's no Marty Sklar's out yeah, there either. Right, I mean, right. he was the face of Imagineering for so many decades mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and I mean, do you guys think that there's anybody in the company? Do you guys think that they're going to hire or I should say raise up a CEO from within the company or do you guys see it coming from outside of the Walt Disney Company? I I 100% until you said it thought it was somebody within the company, but there's nothing saying that it doesn't have to be someone in the company, but that's just what they had been doing for the last couple. So, yeah. I feel like you need someone who understands. Yes, it's a very unique. The DNA of Disney. It's a very unique Mm -hmm. company. So I think it'd be Eisner. Eisner had no ties to Disney. That's true. And I mean, he's 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 running stuff over at Paramount. And then I think I can do this. I think it took a little while for him to get his feet under him. But yeah. But But also he he worked with Frank Wells, who also came over like they co took over kind of right. Yeah. Well, so Frank was from Frank was from Paramount also. So he didn't have he didn't have any Disney experience either. And so it is crazy 
to to think that there could be somebody from outside of Disney because we all still envision Disney as a family company. Truly, if we think about it, we're like, oh, but it's got this family heritage and this DNA to it. But the the precedent has been set there. I mean, especially the fact that Eisner took over from or basically yeah. took the reins from Ron Miller, who was right. Disney blood. Mm-hmm. Well, mm-hmm. Disney married in blood. Yep. yep. And but I, I cannot wait. I really want to have an episode <laughs> where we talk after you guys read okay. Disney War because it is. And maybe I'm just hyping it up, but it's my favorite Disney book I've ever read. And it's wow. all I think you guys will really like it because it's all just corporate stuff. Well, There's, I think it's probably an interesting time to read it, too, since we do have yes. kind yes, of this yes. uneasiness going on right now with it. It actually is the perfect time to read it now that I think about it. I just finished <laughs> it at my second or third read on it Dang. just a couple of weeks ago, and it was it was perfect timing, just Dang. perfect Ooh. timing. So I highly recommend it. Well, I'm going on a Disney cruise next month, and we're taking the train down there, so I think I know what book I'm going to bring Ooh, with me. Wow. There you <laughs> go. Yes. So here's a question for you, Alex, to, to wrap this part of the conversation up. Yeah. Uh, do, can you think of anybody not at Disney who you'd be like, they'd be good to to take that job? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, honestly, as weird as this may sound, and it's never going to happen, I think somebody who understands the, the creative process and would be perfect for the role would be Jon Favreau. Oh. I think I think that Jon Favreau as being a director, as being a creative, but also having the corporate uh, experience, mm-hmm. <laughs> I think, would be a great person, because when you look at when you look at guys like Dave Filoni, who's doing everything with Star Wars, yeah. he's a great candidate, but he is just so like all he does is bleed Star Wars. And mm-hmm. I don't think that he would know mm-hmm. anything else where right. Favreau has that ability yeah. to do something like the Jungle Book, but then also has the ability to do stuff within the Star Wars realm and also has Marvel experience. Mm-hmm. I mean, this guy is in every single thing. So if if there were if it was somebody from outside of the corporate Disney side, I would think that John Faber would be actually a great candidate for that role. I don't hate that. That's a that's a really great thought. I love all him, I'm though. thinking is happy runs Disney. <laughs> <laughs> He's gotten a promotion tag. OK, he's gotten a promotion. I love John Favreau. He's <laughs> he's Tony would want Tony would want go. that. There you go. So to kind of wrap up our time with you, Alex, I want to talk real quick how your time in the jungle then transitioned to what you're doing now with all of your different podcasts, including the one that started it all, The Backside of Water. What was the transition? Yes. How did you start that? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, you guys have two more hours. <laughs> <laughs> so so basically the way that it all worked out is I, I kind of came into podcasting the exact opposite as you, Teresa. I was super <laughs> stoked about podcasts. I loved podcasts. In fact, there was one that I was just deeply obsessed with called Community Unicorn Weekly that existed back in the day. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, it was, it's to this day, I was listening to episodes again. I was like, this is one of the most polished podcasts I have ever heard. It was just phenomenal, the segments that they would create. But it was mostly Walt Disney World related. And I remember in like right after I got married, I really started getting like obsessively fascinated by podcasting and I wanted to start a podcast, but I didn't really know how to do it. And the biggest thing that I was trying to figure out is I've got to have some sort of content for it. Like what is something that I can talk about all day, every day and never get tired of it. And the thing that I thought was well, Disney and I was like, OK, well, then I've got to I've got to narrow that down a little bit, narrow that focus. How can I narrow that focus to keep it as as directed as possible? And I was like, Disney. Disneyland. Let's talk Disney. And I was like, okay, well, what are we going to talk about with Disneyland? Because with podcasting, I've just inherently learned that it's all about the niche. How can you get specific into something very niche? And for us, it was Disneyland attractions that we were like, let's tell the story and the history. Because when I was going through uh, the training programs, learning all of these stories around things like the Jungle Cruise or the 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 story of Captain Blood over in Haunted Mansion, or learning about which is an awesome story. Like, Listen to what? our Haunted Mansion episode <laughs> and you'll actually action. learn. Yeah, you'll learn about Captain Blood and who's hanging at the top of the, the Haunted Mansion and where all the crows came from, because originally the crows were the ones telling the story through the entire attraction. 
action. And it was the story of this Captain Blood who basically just offed his wife and then offed himself. It got real dark to the point where <laughs> Walt was like, not going to happen. And so you hear these stories and it's stuff that's fascinating to us as Disney fans. And I was like, well, let's just do this, but let's do it in kind of like a, a walking tour way. Let's do this systematically so we're not just like shotgun blasting everywhere. Instead, we'll do it so where you can put your headphones on and you can go left like I always do and you can hit play and it will tell you about Adventureland and then you move into the first attraction there and you learn about the Tiki Room and then you move on and you go to Jungle Cruise, so on and so forth. And here we are. This is our, gosh, our eighth year and we still are only halfway through Tomorrowland and still have Galaxy's Edge and Main Street left to do. <laughs> you haven't even gotten to DCA yet. <laughs> no, wow. no. Our next project is actually going to be the Florida project. So we're actually going to oh. do uh, uh, something a little bit different where we actually do more of like a, like an NPR type style where we go dark for like a year and we just write a really in-depth series that we release in like eight episodes that are each like an hour and a half long. And it's going to show the whole story of Walt Disney and his building of the original Epcot. Ooh. And then we might go to DCA. <laughs> and then maybe. Yeah. Wow. yeah. Wow. So yeah, that's what, wow. and then that just basically spawned everything outside of that. And so then we started doing, did you know Disney? Because we wanted to do something that was a little bit more off the cuff and be able to have a lot of guests on because with our backside of water, we're so rigid and we're so like systematic that it's hard to have guests on there. And as a result, we wanted to have something where we could do that. So we off shot the, uh, did you know Disney? And then last year starting our smugglers dispatch podcast, because I'm probably equally obsessed with Star Wars as I am Disney and my buddy Michael approached me and was like you want to do this and I was like um of course I must do this so we've been having a ton of fun over there and I just love podcasting because I don't know if you guys have realized this or not but I love to talk <laughs> really you know I feel like you've been so such quiet. a good job to it and Alex such a good job <laughs> you have a great voice by the way I do love listening to you mm -hmm. oh well thank you because then I walk away from this and I'm like man I just did nothing but talk that entire time that was That's you were so exactly annoying what a podcast is no it's perfect <laughs> <laughs> Well, the good news is, Alex, uh, usually I'm the one that rambles on for a long time, so... <laughs> I'm glad I could take that from you, Tig, just a little bit. Yes, yes. Teresa and I go back and forth on it, and we'll have times where we're like, you said everything. <laughs> Isn't it and funny how that works out? It. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I feel like if you don't have the self-awareness of that, then there's something wrong. Because then you, you, you realize that you are the talker. So usually when you're self-aware, you're not talking too much. So that's that's a positive. <laughs> well, there we go. It, it goes back and forth. It's it just, all about it the It depends balance. on mood and everything. And yeah, topic, so. usually. Oh, totally. <laughs> but I will tell you, when we have guests on, I love when guests just talk mm -hmm. because... It, well, one, it makes our job so much easier. But also, I feel like usually, <laughs> unless we're cutting you off, you're saying something really good and interesting, and then it gives us even more stuff to trigger on to. So, but Alex, we could talk to you forever. And Likewise, we'll have to you have guys you are such a blast again. to chat with. We'll have to have you on again, but we got to get to our last question. If yes. you could work at Disneyland, what would you do? Sky's limit could be any job, even a made up one. Oh, shoot. Don't Dang. say you're going to be a, a like pool cleaner for the jungle cruise. I would clean rivers. the jungle water. <laughs> Uh, let's see here. I we've ooh. stumped him, Tree. So we've. Stumped I think he him. needs to be a tour guide because he's just this wealth ooh, of knowledge. That but like would a be behind fun. the scenes tour guide that tells you about like all of the crazy things about attractions that you. Can't, that would be super cool. Like, I mean, find. Okay, so if it's if it could be a made up job, I would like to be. You know what I would love? This is what I would love to do. I would love to work in the Disney archives, and Ooh. I would love to then be the person who is like the liaison down at Disneyland, who shares the history of what's found in the archives down at the park. That is the dream job. They need that. I feel like come, there's a missed opportunity here because Disneyland yes. fans like us just. Love the you cannot tell us enough about the history and all the different layers and different things. All we don't care. It could be the smallest little. People get obsessive about that brick wall where they were testing out how to like. People love that. It's it's. I mean, yep. it's it's just a testing wall, but it's still there because there's a story. There's, there's a story behind and it. People yeah, love exactly. It. So there need. You're right. There needs to be a, a Walt Disney Archives liaison. Guys, that's a Disneyland. great question. I've never had anybody ask me that question. I've never thought about that question. If I could work at the park doing anything, what would I do? Mm -hmm. 
That's a good question. We've had some interesting, some really cool and really interesting answers come out of that. Real quick, what's the weirdest one that you got? Like the most off the wall? I don't know what the weirdest one. There's got to be one that stands out. We've got some ones that were just really creative. Like, Mm -hmm. that would be a really amazing job. Nothing like creepy or weird? No, No. nothing creepy or weird. No. Oh, that's boring. We have there boring are some guests, people apparently. that are just like just keep that keep it classic. They're like the j- Jungle Cruise. I want to be a Jungle Cruise skipper or uh, tour guide, you know, and just it mm-hmm. just takes the positions as they are currently. But then there's people like yourself that kind of build off of it. And you're like, I can do whatever I want. Hmm, okay. Yeah, Walt Disney called <laughs> Bring it, it on. plussing. Yeah, you got to exactly. plus your job when you're there. Exactly. I love that. Bring it on. Very cool. Guys, this was a blast. Thanks for having me on. This Thank is always so fun to on. chat with you guys. Yes. And like I yeah. said, we're going to have to have you on because I feel like you're like this endless wealth of knowledge, especially with Adventureland stuff. And I'm curious and excited to learn more about the Tiki Room. And Tag, I know, wants to learn more about Big Thunder oh, we, Mountain. Yeah, River. we didn't even yes. talk about Thunder. I know. There's so much to cover on the There's Haunted so Thunder Mountain. Oh, yes. Now, yes. Alex, I know we've dropped it throughout the episode, but if people <laughs> want to find where you are and listen to you everywhere where can they find and follow you on the internet yes the backside of water podcast that's the best place to find us you can find us on any one of your podcast players of choice out there i would also like to plug did you know disney because we're we're reinstating that after it went patreon exclusive and Mm -hmm. uh we also do smugglers dispatch which again for star wars fans out there we try to make it so we don't go super deep nerd star wars but we go nerdy enough to keep you engaged but also to get those deep nerd star wars fans like enough to keep them keep them listening you can also find us on social media i'm going to plug our i'm going to plug our event we've got an open house coming up on march 4th of 2023 at the uh hojo anaheim we're going to be up in their house of the retro future suite so we'll be doing a meet and greet up there from like 12 p.m to 2 p.m on march 4th and then we're going to be doing stuff with uh the that night you guys are going to get this announcement but i'm not going to do everything with it we're doing we're taping a live <laughs> a, a live episode in the house of the retro Super future cool. suite um and so we're still working out details on that and then the next day is adventureland day march 5th is adventureland day and everybody should come out because tiki tony murphy has put together an absolutely fantastic day that puts things like uh like dapper day to shame even though dapper wow. day is awesome i just yeah. love adventureland day that's it's well, you know definitely those... it's on our list we tried oh, to yes. make it work this year for those of you that don't know adventureland <sighs> day is march 5th i so wish parks. you guys could be there i know we do too uh, this is when i need my teleporter so i can just like zip zip right be there be back <laughs> but yeah so plug for adventureland day too because i wanted to talk about that with you too since it's you know yes. less than a month away but we're really excited for you about that and you guys should get tiki tony on let me know if you want yeah. to because i can connect you with tony and he's an awesome dude he would love to chat with you guys for sure as you like as you know we like talking with people we like talking and th- that's and talking why i people. send you guys people because <laughs> it's a great place to be yes thank you alex well thank you so so much for taking the time to chat with us and like i said we look forward to the next time that we get to talk with you more about your adventures and experiences looks like we're coming in for a landing gang but please stay listening until trivia comes to a stop the menus can walk to the nearest exit thanks for listening to the eight wonder of the world dear weekly well, welcome back to Trivia Land. I'm glad to have you back. It's been lonely over here. <laughs> Aw, sorry. We should have brought Alex in on all of this. Oh, that would have been so much fun. Anyway, let's let's dive into the answers. I'm sure we've waited long enough. First question this week, true or false? The partner statue of Walt Disney is actually one inch taller than the real Walt Disney. You both answered false, which is correct. Wow. But you both guessed false. Not not close to why. It's actually seven inches taller than Walt. Oh wow. Seven. The partner statue stands at six foot five. Yeah, I, I don't I remember like I just re- I remember that Walt wasn't like a particularly tall super person. Super tall person. He was like average for the time. Mm-hmm. He's still average for the time. Yeah. It's it's hard to judge since it's up on the pedestal. Right. And so moving on, question number two. The audio hint I had for you, you figured out it is a water attraction. And you stuck with the right one. It is Grizzly River Run. Woo! Did you did you switch to did you jump into I my did. raft he, instead of get you got out of your log? I did. <laughs> then it, it I just pulled our picture from the studios and yes, it is I definitely could, tall. Yeah, I could not remember. I'm Me like, either. Just, we're standing next to it and I don't remember how tall it was. Tall. Yeah, tall. 
I mean, look at you next. <laughs> I mean, anyway. Okay. Very tall. Grizzly River Run. Woo! See, I didn't have you marked over. I had you at Splash still. No, you, you talked him out of it thanks to the musical. Oh, night. yeah. Dang it. Why did I do that? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you are two nights. Third question from listener Tara F. There are lots of fun car puns oh. at Flo's V8 Cafe, like the Automatic 100 Tabletop Jukebox Music Selector, where you can flip through dozens of Motorama Girls' best songs, including a parody to which e-ticket attraction, the name of the parody song is Yoto Yoto, A Parking Space for Me. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. That's good. Pirates of the Caribbean. It is not a small world or Big Thunder Mountain, but it's still good. I am trying to figure out still what the parody song for Big Thunder Mountain would be. <laughs> could use Since there's help. no attraction song. No, but like it could be parodying like the story of Big Thunder Mountain. You know, <laughs> hang on to them hats and glasses. I don't know. Sure. We'll go with that one. Dang, yo-ho, yo-ho. <laughs> Yoto, Yoto, a parking space for me. That's so good. That Our good. final question is, which attractions have in-ride photos? The correct answer is there are six attractions with in-ride photos, and you gave me the correct six. Woo! Space Mountain, Buzz Lightyear, Splash Mountain, The Incredicoaster, Guardians of the Galaxy, and Radiator Springs Racers. It did pay me, though, to include Buzz Lightyear because of the photo quality. That thing is taken on like an old school, I mean, it's grainy and terrible. Same with, um, not Disneyland, but Spaceship Earth, I feel, has like a very bad quality (laughs) in ride photo. They must have been like some of the first ones or something. something. Like, and it's the first software, so they haven't updated it or something. Get your pictures ready for those and make sure you're smiling good. Just that way you can, you know, grab the handles when the lift car starts to go down in Guardians <laughs> of the Galaxy. <laughs> or duck buying the person in front of you on Spouch Mountain. Oh, that's also smart to do. You're still going to get wet. <laughs> anyway, yes. I hope you enjoyed trivia this week. If you have some more questions you think producer Vern and I should ask to TNT, just send us an email. It's trivia at dlweekly.net. Well, we will be back next week with more Disneyland news and information. Until then, go out and enjoy the parks. Please remain seated until the podcast comes to a complete stop and the doors have opened. Then collect your belongings, watch your head, and step carefully from the episode. On behalf of all of our crew. Thanks for traveling with us, and we hope you have a happy and memorable visit here at DL Weekly.